Wow, who knew a book about co a Congress could attract such a <laughs> such a crowd? Um, welcome. I'm uh, I'm Bradley Graham. I'm the co-owner of Politics and Prose, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine. And on behalf of everybody at PNP, thank you, uh, thank you so much for for being here. Uh, so so part of the story uh, that we're here to mark today uh, does involve a, a chapter in the in the history of Congress uh, told by. Uh, John Lawrence in his new book, The Class of 74. Uh, but another part uh, reflects J John's own journey and a sort of completing of the circle for him. Uh, because back in the 1970s, John earned a PhD in history at Berkeley. Uh, but instead of pursuing a career in academia, he ended up on Capitol Hill as a staff member in the House of Representatives. He spent 38 years there. Uh, the, uh, uh, really initially for, uh, for a number of years for uh, Congressman G George Miller from California. And then the final eight years, uh, he served as chief of staff to uh, Nancy Pelosi. When he left the Hill a few years ago, he returned to the uh, academic track, teaching at the uh, University of California's Washington Center and writing a book that draws on his long experience uh, in Congress. Uh, he arrived uh, on the Hill uh, with the members of the class of 74 and outlasted nearly all of them. <laughs> uh, but he's chosen to focus on this group, not uh, because he coincided with it. Uh, as he'll explain more fully in a minute, uh, this was a special class, uh, elected in the immediate aftermath of the Watergate scandal, they constituted one of the largest infusions of new faces in the House in modern political history and entered Congress amid high expectations of major institutional reform, uh, showing he has what it takes after all this time to be a careful, methodical, clear-minded historian. John examines the record of what the class of 74 achieved and what it didn't, and he draws several lessons for our current times from the experiences of the 94th Congress. Praising the book, a reviewer in Kirkus called it, quote, a compelling account of a vital era and, quote, an essential work of congressional history. Please join me in welcoming John Lawrence. Thanks, Brad, and uh, thank you to all of you um, for for coming uh, tonight. I really uh, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank you for. Uh, I know this is Saturday night, and many of you probably have something better you might have been doing. But I'm I'm tremendously grateful that you came uh, to this talk. Um, I want to uh, mention there are a few people who are here. First, I want to acknowledge my family and thank them, Deborah and my brother Sid. <laughs> his wife, Larcia, for coming. Uh, I also, uh, I'm, there, I'm glad there are a lot of people here, but I can't tell if Lauren is here, but Lauren Sharp, my agent, was going to be here, and I want to thank her for sticking with me throughout this very long uh, process. And I can't tell which of my colleagues here, I, I see Jen Diascro is in the back there. Uh, my very, very good friend, Francis Lee, from the University of Maryland, who's a terrific political scientist, is here. And um, if I've missed anybody, I apologize. In particular, I want to thank, uh, there are members of the class who are here, and I want to thank them in particular, Bob Carr, Henry Waxman, Les O'Coin, Marty Russo, Phil Sharp, Phil Sharp, and I'm not sure if there's, Dave Evans, wife. Da Dave Evans' his wife is here. I'm not sure if there's anybody else. Um, and I, I particularly thank them and about 40 other uh, members of the class, uh, other members, uh, uh, <clears throat> staff people, uh, house officers, uh, who uh, participated in the research that went into uh, this book. Uh, the uh, interviews that I did with them really provide a great deal of the original intellectual material that uh, informs the, the story and the message of this book. And I, I'm tremendously grateful for them for sharing uh, what are humorous stories or poignant stories. They're consistently thoughtful stories. And there are a lot of them 
that are are recorded uh, in this in this book. There are many. I'm not going to try to tell stories here. I'm not going to read the book because you can uh, do that on your own. But I do want to just say that it's the power of these individual stories that cut through what is sometimes very complex congressional history and congressional procedure and explain what working in that institution is is oh I see Tim Worth is here also so I want to acknowledge his 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 present another class member. Um, uh, there's a terrific story here that Marty Russo shared with me. Uh, Marty from from Chicago, uh, the first time that he as a candidate uh, met the uh, formidable mayor of, of uh, Chicago. Uh, Richard Daly uh, did not go exactly as Marty had hoped uh, it, 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 uh, it might. Uh, there's a terrific story in here about Jim Blanchard, who is from Michigan, who later became uh, the governor of Michigan, then ambassador uh, to Canada, uh, when uh, speaking on behalf of many of his, his classmates who were tremendously frustrated uh, that they weren't able to do more, uh, went up to Tip O'Neill, who was at that point the majority leader, and said, maybe you could lead a revolt against Carl Albert. Uh, that didn't go so well. And then the book, the book starts with just a great story um, involving Tom Downey uh, from New York, who was the youngest member of the class, uh, and his encounter on the House floor with Bill Barrett from Pennsylvania, who had been in Congress for two years uh, by the time Tom Downey was born. And uh, you can imagine how that went. Uh, it's the opening story uh, in the book. The value of these these stories and many many more that are in the book uh, are are uh, are just so tremendous because they give you the motivation why these people ran, which has been largely misunderstood. It goes into the actions they took as members of Congress, and so much of this, I have to say, would be lost to history without their sharing these stories with me and 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 the the book that's resulted. It's a very important time, as Brad said, I think, to study about Congress, and I think people are interested in, in, in learning more about Congress. We're looking a lot like some of the earlier periods of, of congressional history in the 1950s and 1960s that helped motivate some of the members in the class in 1974 to run for office. We see Congress really abandoning a lot of its constitutional responsibilities, backtracking on years, really decades, of a bipartisan effort to reassert Congress as a co-equal branch of, of government to claw back some of the authority and some of the powers that have been lost to the executive branch. A failure to legislate, even on issues that have broad public and bipartisan support, just an incapacity of the institution. Uh, to function, a failure to conduct independent oversight of the executive branch, one of the fundamental reforms that came out of the 1970s, and an unreasonable deference to the executive branch uh, where uh, the Congress should instead be taking uh, the initiative. Too many ways, I feel, uh, the Congress is beginning to resemble what, what Joe Clark, senator from Pennsylvania, referred to in the 1960s as the sapless branch of government. And uh, hopefully, uh, this book and, and other uh, efforts that are underway, including books by many of uh, the members of, of uh, several members of the class, are going to help uh, help stimulate a new generation of people to come into into government, run for Congress, and that's a very gratifying development that we've seen. Now, it's not easy to study Congress, and not many historians do it. When I was at Berkeley, there were no people who were studying congressional history. Uh, most history is written. Most political uh, books are written about. Uh, presidents. It's a lot easier to write books about presidents. All their papers are in nice, ordered libraries that are named after them. It's really easy to find them. Uh, and in just in just this year, I mean, there are new books about. Obviously, there's new books about Barack Obama, but there are new books that have been written about Franklin Roosevelt. There are books that have been written. There's a new book about James Buchanan. There's a new book about Chester A. Arthur. There's a new book about Millard Fillmore. I have a warm feeling because my jug band in high school was named for Millard Fillmore. But other than that, really? Uh, um, in 70 years of the Bancroft Prize for history and the Pulitzer Prize for history, there has never once been a book given an award for congressional history. Um, and so it's, it's uh, you know, we've seen, we've seen books about presidents, about slavery, about labor, which is what my field was. Uh, we've even had a, a book that actually won, won Pulitzer Prize for the history of the cigarette, but nothing on, on Congress. And I think, I think that's, that helps describe the difficulty of, of writing uh, about, about this institution. So why did I bother doing it? <laughs> um, 
Well, first of all, I felt that the, my combination of both an academic training and uh, decades of working in Congress gave me some specific insights. And my friendship with many of these uh, members gave me the opportunity to sit down and gather their thoughts and gather their, their stories and their recollections and their analyses in a way that, frankly, uh, another author might not have the opportunity uh, to do. I felt that there was a necessity also because of the way in which this class has been written about. Norm Ornstein, a very distinguished political scientist in town, a great pundit as well, said this is the most consequential congressional class of the 20th century. Now, I want to be very clear. This book is not an homage to the class of 1974, okay? It, is a, it looks at their record. It looks at what they accomplished. It looks at their historical significance. Uh, it is, it, it, there are times in which I'm clarifying the record. There are times in which I'm going to criticize the record. And frankly, some of the members themselves and their recollections were a little critical of their own behavior. Uh, and, and that shows up, Mr. Carr. But the, <laughs> but the real problem that I started off with and that uh, is this. If you read about the class of 1974, the one thing that you probably know is, A, they're called the Watergate Babies. And number two, they came to Washington, they threw out three chairmen. And after that, it all disappears into a very gray fog. We don't know very much else uh, about them. Even Robert Remini, who was the historian of the House of Representatives, wrote a 500-page book on the House of Representatives, devoted less than one page to the class that Norm Ornstein has called the most consequential congressional class of the 20th century. Now, the class Admittedly, it's a difficult, it's a large group of people. It was an unusual group of people in many respects. Toby Moffat, who was a member from Connecticut, said we were young, we looked weird, I can't even believe we got elected. And that does, <laughs> that does, ex it does explain some of, some of that. And, and, and they also didn't always get very strong reviews from the congressional leadership, which is in some ways is not surprising because in some ways they were very critical of the congressional uh, leadership. Tip O'Neill famously in his autobiography said, you know, these guys, they never, they never did anything politically. They never, they never licked any envelopes. They never walked precincts. They never stuck uh, flyers underneath automobile windows. And the Republicans were even less uh, sympathetic. They, one Republican leader who I quote in the book said they were wild, uninhibited, downright rude, it gets worse, intemperate and immature. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that's not true. That's not true. And as with much historical study, you've got to get beneath the, the simple characterizations and find out what the actual historical record is. And the actual record is that this was a, a very diverse class of people. Uh, it was not just a group of young uh, uh, anti-establishment activists. It included, it's true, people who came out of untraditional politics, but they came out of politics nevertheless, the consumer movement, the peace movement, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement. There were small businessmen. There was even a house painter. But there were also a lieutenant governor. There were mayors. There were legislative leaders like Les O'Coin from state legislatures. And in fact, about the same proportion of people who had served in elective office as in the rest of Congress. So the, one of the uh, misunderstandings and misconceptions of the class was that it was a less experienced group of political people. I would argue in the book, they're actually quite a sophisticated group of political people, many elected and many who had fought political battles in, in, other, in, in, uh, in other environments. Environment. But they were subjected to withering criticism for not accomplishing more than they did. In fact, by the middle of 1975, now keep in mind, they had been in office at that point six months. They were called failures because they had come to Washington and they had not changed the congressional institution and they had not passed backlogged legislation which had been incapable of passing in the Congress for months, for years, in some cases, decades beforehand. So one of the points I try to make really clearly in this book is that it's true that they were a different group in many respects. They were an impatient group. They were impatient with the obstructionism of the Congress. They were impatient with the elitism that they encountered. They were impatient with an institutional lethargy. And that, that unusual uh, feeling of, of impatience was interpreted by many as hostility to the institution itself. But that is not the case. This is a group of people that came to Washington very committed 
to working in the institution. They did not come to Washington with the notion of destroying the institution or of destroying government or diminishing public esteem, but rather rehabilitating government because government was fundamentally important for them to achieve the goals, the social, political, economic, international goals to which they were politically devoted. And in fact, if you look at their voting record, notwithstanding the criticism, uh, they were among the most loyal people to the Democratic leadership and then to the Democratic president, who's elected uh, two years later, Jimmy Carter, of any group within the Congress. Uh, they're, they're, they voted as a bloc uh, consistently uh, with the leadership. Uh, one of the other points that's really important, though, in evaluating these, these criticisms that's typically been made is that they're faulted for not being more, more aggressive as reformers and not accomplishing more as reformers. It's very important to remember, that, that, which I think is largely misunderstood. They didn't come to Congress for the most part with the intent of reforming Congress. As I talked to these dozens of these members and I asked what motivated you to run for Congress in the first place, they did not cite the need for uh, reforming the seniority system or redistributing power among the subcommittees or changing the motion to recommit. Uh, that was not the reason. They, they were not aware of the earlier reform efforts for the most part, the, the Jimmy Roosevelt group or McCarthy's Marauders or Julia Hansen's select committee or Dick Bowling's select committee or the extensive reform proposals of the Democratic study group. They didn't know about that. That wasn't their motive for running. Their motive for running over and over, I found, as I talked to them, was to end the war in Vietnam. That's why they came to Washington. And within four months, they passed a resolution in the caucus offered by Bob Carr that cut off funding for the war in Vietnam. And so by their standards, they were quite a successful group. Let's remember what that atmosphere, why they, they felt so strongly about that. They came to Washington at a time when the public criticism, the public attitude towards government was extremely negative. They came in the wake of Watergate, the Watergate hearings, the resignation, the, the investigations, the resignation, and then the surprising pardon. They came after years, almost a decade, of horrendous, divis horrendous divisively, divisive war in Vietnam. Uh, they came at a time as Congress was just beginning to claw back some of the powers that it had abandoned to the imperial presidency during the, uh, the most of the mid 20th century. And they pa had passed the War Powers Resolution in 1973 and the Budget and Empowerment Control Act uh, in 1974. They had, they had in fact tried to pass uh, more extensive internal reforms to make the institution a more responsive one. Uh, they had passed the Legis Legislative Reform Acts in 1946 and 1970. They had passed the Subcommittee Bill of Rights in 73, but there was still a huge backlog of reform that had not, that had not occurred before this group uh, uh, had arrived. And in fact, the major uh, efforts in the early 70s, the select committees that were created under Julia Hansen and under Dick Bowling uh, failed. And they failed in large part because although the Democratic caucus since the late 1950s had increasingly had a liberal ten, uh, tinge to it, the Congress itself was pretty much controlled by the conservative coalition. That was the coalition of Southern Democrats, which is the reason the Democratic Party was the dominant party. It's the reason the Democratic Party controlled Congress for 58 out of 62 years between 1934 and 1994. Uh, it was the reason that, I'm sorry, 32 in 1994. <laughs> My math isn't good, that's why I'm not a political scientist. The, the, uh, that co conservative coalition of Southern Democrats and Republicans was able to squelch most of the progressive legislation, much legislation, and certainly the reform of the House rules that would have, would have uh, reformed the House and, and democratized uh, the House. That conservative coalition was then doubled down in the Democratic caucus by the reverence to the seniority system, which uh, gave uh, itself a reform from 1910, which gave chairmanships based purely upon how long you were alive. If you had a pulse, you, you, were, you, were, the ch you were the chairman. And the notion there was to, to, to award chairmanships on a dispassionate basis so that you didn't just select people who agreed with the speaker or just the person the, who, who, was, uh, uh, who was able to win support from the, the Committee on Ways and Means that did committee assignments. It was an independent way, but as time changed and people lived longer, it evolved into a system that rewarded 
that branch, that, that region of the country that where people were most likely to be reelected, and that was the one party South. And so by the time the mid 60s rolls around, the chairmanships are disproportionately in the hands of Southern conservatives, who in some cases are voting 75 to 80 percent of the time with Republicans. And so you had this enormous tension growing within the Democratic caucus between this seniority system, which held up legislation that the caucus was increasingly sympathetic towards, uh, towards, towards uh, passing. And in addition to this, much of what was going on in the Congress at that point was, was very, very difficult for the average person to discern. Uh, people don't remember. There, there, were not, there was not television coverage. You couldn't just go and flip on the television and see what was being debated on the House floor. But there also were not things like written committee reports. And subcommittee markups and full committee markups were held in secret. So you had no idea. There weren't even recorded votes in committees, subcommittees, and on the committee of the whole House uh, through most of the 1960s. So Congress was a pretty, a pretty closed uh, process, pretty elitist process, dominated by a group that increasingly was out of, out of uh, uh, touch and out of step with the very group that was the majority, the Democratic caucus. And then the reinforcements arrived, as Bella Abzug uh, announced, uh, when the class of 74 walked in the room. Uh, 40, picked up 49 seats, uh, 96 new Democratic, uh, 76 new Democratic members, 93 new members altogether, and, and, uh, and they were able to accomplish the reforms that are, are, are discussed and documented uh, in the book. Um, one of the other things that I talk about a lot in the book is the political atmosphere and the political culture of the 1970s. And I think it's really important to, to uh, uh, it's an important part of the book uh, because it, it is overlooked and misunderstood in terms of the environment in which this class and the 94th Congress was operating. The, 70, the mid 70s was marked by a significant revival of conservative politics. It's often overlooked because the Democratic victories were so dramatic in the congressional elections in 74, 76, they were, they were ratified. And in fact, those losses were significant for the Republican Party. It took the Republican Party, now there were Republicans who were predicting that as the South became more Democrat, more Republican, as conservatives moved from, a, from the, de the traditional support for the Democratic Party to a reviving Republican Party in the South, that uh, the, the trajectory was that Democrats would lose Southern seats and the, the committee, the, the parties would become uh, on greater parity. Um, and and, and that, that, is, that is in fact what was occurring, but these large majorities that were won in the 70s sort of obscured that, that movement for a long time. It took them, it, it took the Republicans 10 years from the Watergate election to return to where they were at that time. So they lost so many seats that because of the benefits of incumbency, because of reapportionment, because a lot of these guys, as you read in the book, turned out to be pretty damn good politicians and knew how to get themselves reelected. It took the Republicans until the mid to late 80s just to get back to where they were in 1972. And of course, during that period of time, these developments in conservative politics emerged. The, the, the rebirth of a Southern Republican Party that, that moved closer and closer to, to parity, this, which of course, as they became closer, there became a constant competition, a greater competition as a younger generation of Republicans anticipated that by differentiating themselves and taking more extreme positions, they were able to in fact compete for control. And Francis has written really important book on, on, on this, which I, strongly recommend to you with insecure majorities, where she talks about that constant competition as fueling a lot of the, uh, uh, fueling a lot of the, by, of the partisanship and, and rancor that's come to characterize contemporary politics. It's also the era where you saw, partly as a result of independent money that was opened by the Campaign Reform Act, of, uh, the Financing Act in 1974, a huge growth of independent money outside the controls of the party, under the control of more ideological and less collaborative uh, individuals that were driving more extreme politics, the revival of a grassroots evangelical movement that provided both ideology but also grassroots political organization on behalf of more extreme groups. And also something that I talk about in the book a lot, which is the, the emergence of political issues that really have deep cultural uh, 
uh, bases to them. So we're not just arguing here about you know Higher Education Act or about the Housing Act or about transportation. We're talking about issues that increasingly, on both sides of the aisle, have very strong cultural, in some cases religious, uh, significance to them. And one of the arguments I make in the book is that as you get into those arguments, whether it's guns or abortion or nuclear freeze or a whole series of these issues, it just becomes harder and harder to compromise because you're compromising around matters of principle, not around splitting the difference, which is typically the way collaborative legislating uh, uh, occurs. Some of these reforms uh, that we think of as having, as having opened the institution had those unintended consequences that occasionally sneak in to, uh, to political uh, developments. I mentioned special interest money. Uh, obviously, the idea of expanding the role of PACs in, in 1974 turned out to have a slightly different impact than, than people thought it was going to. But even some of the reforms that the class helped to support uh, had the same effect. And I, do, I should re reiterate this point. Most of the reforms that this class is credited with having promoted and having, having uh, put into place were not uh, ones that they developed, that they proposed. These are reforms that had been generated by uh, people like Dave Obey or people like Don Frazier or people like Bowling or Phil Burton. And this class came and was able to provide the crucial votes to enact them. But this was not a class that devised most of those reforms. Those reforms were very helpful in the sense of opening up the institution. They put some real checks onto the seniority system. They did throw out three chairmen. And interestingly, many of the other chairmen got the message. Another half dozen retired that Congress. And, and so by the time the next Congress begins, well over half the, the committees in the House of Representatives have new chairmen. And they're a lot more responsive than they were before they were getting uh, voted on and, and some were, 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 uh, were thrown out. But other of the, other of the reforms had over the longer term, some dubious uh, uh, effects. So for example, one of the major improvements that was made was that power was decentralized. Greater power was given to subcommittees. That allowed more people to serve as subcommittee chairmen. It allowed issues to come up in subcommittees uh, more autonomously than from the full committee so that more players had the ability to put issues on the table. A lot of the issues that class members brought to Congress that had been stifled, whether that had to do with energy or consumer affairs or public health or air quality uh, or children's policy or disability. These are issues that had been squelched by these more conservative chairmen. Uh, now there was a venue in the subcommittees where they could hold hearings. Uh, these hearings were very often being televised. That legislation began to move through the Congress and develop public support, and that was all great. But it also meant that more people had a chance to participate. There were more opportunities for offering amendments. And as we move to another reform, which is television coverage, uh, there is uh, the, the offering of amendments becomes a, an act of, of political theater, uh, uh, offered not so much to affect the outcome of legislation, but to, uh, to put more marginal people into positions where they have to either vote against their political leadership or they have to vote against their constituencies. And combined with this rise of these culturally divisive issues, that becomes a lightning uh, point in, in, in uh, congressional development over, over that time. So I want to be very clear, though, on this, on this point. I'm not arguing that the class of 1974 caused partisanship. That's not, the, uh, that's not the argument here. What I'm saying is that reforms in the context of the time that I've been discussing served to uh, allow these more divisive, more partisan uh, themes, issues to find a way of, into the political debate, where in an earlier era, along with much more popu popular uh, uh, issues that were, had been squelched, they also might not have been subjected to as much, uh, to as much uh, 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 debate in the Congress. The book, in summary, shows a class that is more, that was more diverse, it was more complex, it was more nuanced than, than the, the history to this point uh, uh, has, has discussed. And it does provide this context for the class and for our contemporary politics. Go back and look at where some of these, some of these roots uh, uh, were, took place. It was an incredible period of time uh, for, for, the, for the members and for the Congress. Lesso coin 
uh, used a phrase, he called it a hinge point in history. Uh, it, something changed, the nature of the institution changed, the, uh, the sense of the people in the, in the institution to change the public debate and to raise issues and to force issues into the public discussion, into the congressional calendar changed. And people thought that it was, it, it, it really did say, t Tim Worth used a, a phrase, he called it a glory time. And, and I found a speech that Tim gave um, back in late 1975, where he said that it, it was a new era. He said it was an era that would emphasize openness and the non-systemic use of power, addressing not simply material wants, but moral aspirations as well. So it, maybe it didn't work out quite that way. You know, it, the, the optimism uh, was somewhat dimmed. Uh, I'm not sure that anyone could have matched that level of expectation, of enthusiasm, uh, or even the unity on votes that, that my, they had demonstrated in the early reform efforts. Once they got around to voting on legislation, they began to vote in more disparate ways as reflecting their own ideology, their constituencies. Uh, so there wasn't that same, that same level of unity. But it's interesting. When an effort was made in 1976 to roll back the reforms, to say, you know, maybe we've gone a little too far. Maybe we are too many opportunities for the Republicans to make us vote on really negative, uh, uh, dangerous, politically vulnerable topics. Uh, the, and there was a caucus meeting. I found these notes. And I don't think it had ever been reported before, where George Miller, who I worked for for 30 years, got up and said, you know, uh, the, the, the proposal was to increase the number of votes that it would require to get a recorded vote from 20, which is pretty easy to get a recorded vote, to 36. And Miller got up and he said, you know what? Uh, that's just the wrong thing to do. I understand we have to vote on really unpopular issues, but you know what? Someday, imagine, we might be in the, major in the minority. <laughs> and uh, maybe we shouldn't quite make it so difficult for the minority to participate. That's the, that's the price of democracy. Um, and th because of the near unanimous support of members of the class of 74, that proposal to make it more difficult to offer amendments was voted down. Now, I should point out, they revisited that a few years later, and they did, in fact, increase the number because <laughs> things did get out of hand. But for the moment, they stuck with the reformist, they stuck with that reformist agenda. So in closing, what, what, what's the bottom line of this book? I, I, the reason I think this book is timely, I think it's important, I'm glad the publisher decided to release it when they did, is that it, it, I think it has the ability actually to, to help rebuild some public confidence in an institution that isn't doing very well right now. Uh, it shows what activists can do when they come into this institution, even if they know that institution has traditionally been resistant to change and, and unwilling to address uh, important public issues. It's, it's not the same uh, in many respects, and I can get into this maybe in the questions, as, as other wave elections, because they did come in very much with this notion that they were going to change this institution and change it back so that Congress was an aggressive, uh, productive, responsive institution to, to the public, which is not what, what, it had, what it had been. And they were going to force the Congress to address the issues that they believed was, was, was so important. And in doing that, they were also going to reassert Congress as a co-equal branch of the government and seize back the power that, uh, that had, been, had been lost. Certainly a lesson that we need to see today where we, we, we're listening to the Speaker of the House and, and others in the Congress just say, we'll just wait for the President, God help us, to send, to send us whatever he wants. That's not the role that Congress is supposed to play. And that was the message and that was the lesson, I think, that, uh, that uh, the class of 1974 delivered when they arrived in Washington. So uh, I remember once uh, that uh, I, we were at a town hall meeting out in California and George Miller was giving a talk uh, to uh, retirees at, uh, at, I think it was at Rossmore Retirement Home, and he went through his long discussion of, of what was going on in Congress and uh, what he had been doing and what the votes had been and all the inside news. And, and uh, after he had talked for about as long as I've talked, he said, uh, are there any questions? And one of the elderly gentlemen stood up and said, yes, what time is dinner? So <laughs> knowing, knowing full well that you may have other things to do, I'm going to stop and open for questions and answers. If you, thank you. If, thanks. If you have questions, um, I would ask that you come over to the microphone, and um, if if possible, and and ask your questions from there. Hi, Joe.
So, John, I think a lot of the people here are hoping for a momentous class of 2018. Uh, we hope that they will all read or will have read already your book. And what do you think, and you've touched on it, of course, what do you think are the main lessons that they should draw from the book if there was such a class of 2018? I assuming they win? Yeah. Because <laughs> there's going to be a class of 2018. Which is, um, you know, I think that the, I think the most important lesson is, is to believe, is, is, where there are a few that are cr critical um, in terms of success. Uh, one is, is to be disciplined about the objectives. You know, the, the, there, there is a, a great need in Congress to discipline yourself not to be off trying to do everything at the same time, to prioritize. Another, I think, which is really important, and this, and this class of 74 was really good at, was getting to know the members, getting to know your, each other. Uh, one of the first things they did was to form an organization uh, called the New Members Caucus. And they met regularly. I mean, Tip O'Neill says, why did they meet for the next seven years or something? You know, they weren't even new members anymore. And the next class didn't form a new members caucus, interestingly. Um, but anybody who's worked in and around Congress or served in Congress knows that those personal relationships are absolutely crucial to gaining trust. And not just talking to the people you agree with, but the people that you don't necessarily agree with. Um, and and uh, I think that those, those are you know, among the things that that class has got to have to do. Other questions? What happened afterwards? How many got beats, for example, in 1976, which was a democratic year, but I would imagine drop off. Then how quickly was the drop off uh, gradually or were a lot of people defeated in the <laughs> next subsequent elections? I think the last member is just retiring this year. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah, the um, and I was interested in the class as a young housing lobbyist and spent a lot of time with this gentleman right there, less a coin uh, and all. And so I'm wondering what, did they all go home to Pocatello or did they stay around and lobby or uh, what happened to them all? That follow-up election was a very important issue. Uh, in fact, they were criticized by some of the some of the more veteran legislators for spending a lot of time thinking about how they would uh, win their re-elections, as though the more senior people didn't worry about how they were going to win their elections. Um, and they had a lesson. They had a they had a historical precedent, which was 1964, where there had been a very large Democratic victory, and that was one of the reasons that. Johnson was able to secure passage of so much of his of his great society legislation, and then in 1976, in 1966, the bottom fell out, and they didn't lose the majority, but they did lose uh, many many seats. So they were they were schooled from the outset uh, in the need for maintaining very close constituent relationships. There's a whole chapter in the book called "Before You Save the World, You Have to Save Your Seat." Uh, which is an old Phil Burton line uh, that that uh, you know go home use newsletters a lot of them proved very very effective in the use of technology mm -hmm. really newfangled inventions like Watts lines and fax machines mm -hmm. um, they had mobile mobile offices that Tom Downey and others uh, developed where they would drive through their districts um, they were very aggressive about about looking at uh, their, their reelect maintaining both the political side and um, they they were hopeful as they got closer to the election that they would be able to hold their losses to no more than 15 and in fact they picked up seat so they, they picked up two so they didn't lose there were two defeats um, and uh, one of them was an ethics issue that um, that uh, uh, probably didn't have a lot to do with politic the politics and and another was was just one of those seats that was considered very marginal but uh, the amazing thing was that their durability um, there by by the early 80s by 82 84 about half the class is gone though um, now that sounds terrible but you know uh, Francis will correct me here if I'm wrong I'm sure but uh, you know the average tenure in the House of Representatives is only about seven or eight years it's not as long as people think certainly not as long as people who want term limits so um, there were quite a number who stayed around into the early 90s. There were a lot who, because of the nature of the subcommittee system, uh, became subcommittee chairmen and were be able to play very effective legislative roles much earlier in their career than, otherwise they, than they might have otherwise been able to. Thank, Thank you, you for the question.
Congressman Russo, yield yeah, the John, floor. I didn't realize you were that funny. Uh, you seemed always to be very serious when you worked in George's office. Uh, one of the reasons we were so motivated uh, to get reelected is because in our first meeting of orientation, the senior members were telling us, look to your left, look to your right. Two of you aren't going to be here. And so 74 of us got reelected because the new caucus, new members caucus, we would spend time figuring out what's the best way to contact our constituents so we can win. Because a lot of us came in from districts like that with 66% Republican districts. Nobody expected us to win again if you were over 55. They never thought you could ever win again. Yes. So that new members caucus, we would meet and talk about how can we do that. And the interesting thing that people may not realize is that we, were, we had 292 Democrats at the time, and we were winning the vote with over 150, 160 votes. So where the hell were the other votes coming from? It was from Pat Schroeder's class, it was from Ron Dellen's class, it was from Dave Obie's class. And the second, and th uh, the second the two years and four years before us were the ones who tried the reforms. They just needed more votes. Right. So exactly right. I'm glad you spelled my name good because <laughs> Tip O'Neill got it wrong and um, glad to be here. I think it's a great book. Thanks, thank you. Thanks, Marty. Can I tell them, Marty? I can tell them, right? In Tip O'Neill's book, he spelled Marty's name Mary Russo. And Mar Marty to has told me every day that he's spoken to me for the last five years, you spell my name. <laughs> and believe me, this is a guy whose name you want to spell right. <laughs> okay. Hey, Jeff. Hello, John. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you have an afterword here describing the outcomes of everyone's life yeah. in, in the class. Very, very useful. Um, Thank you. Speaking of someone who worked in the campaign of 1974 in the state of Iowa and saw you know, four new members of this class uh, show up there, two went on to the Senate. Uh, it was, as you said, a lot of things were happening at that time. You had the War Powers Act. You had uh, the, the new budget legislation. You had many things that were going to shift some of the balance of power from the executive to the legislative. But one of the things in the political arena, which has changed so much, particularly since the 80s and beyond, is campaign financing. And at that time, financing was, I mean, it was critical, but the, the scale was so different. Could you talk a little bit about what fundraising and what that was like for this class and maybe what lessons you could learn from that time that would apply to this time of Mac? Yeah, I mean, it's really a different world. There were people elected in this class uh, who, who uh, I think Bob Edgar or something, got together with a few thousand dollars. I mean, it was just a completely, it was just a completely different world. Um, there, partly I think there was, there was this great shock that some of these people had any chance of winning at all. I, I mean, less, I think, in your district that there hadn't been anybody since the 18, ever? <laughs> okay, like ever. That's a long time. Uh, and, and, and so people, yeah, people were, people were able to win seats um, and uh, with, with very, very small resources. Um, but as the as the court decisions really undercut the the impact of the uh, campaign finance law of 1974, and of course the the uh, subsequent court decisions in McCutcheon and Citizens United and others have have simply shredded any any uh, hope we have of. of in fact, when people ask me, as they do, my students do, and others, um, what do you think is the biggest problem? Contemporaneously, I mean, I really think money is the one that, that worries me the most because it now has a constitutional overlay uh, that makes it much more difficult to to impose the kinds of restrictions that we had hoped we might be able to do in '74 and some subsequent efforts. Les, yeah, ever is a long time, John. Yeah. <laughs> um, I want to share uh, on campaign finance uh, and campaign spending limits. I want to share with a group that in Oregon in 74, uh, the state legislature had um, previously passed the year before a, uh, a, a, a series of limits on various seats uh, statewide, state, as well as federal. It didn't hold up in the, uh, in the uh, courts, but it did for that one election season. Uh, in my race, uh, in the first congressional district, uh, I could not spend more than $75,000 uh, in the primary, and then $75,000 in the general. Uh, nor could my opponent. 
And the amazing thing is that uh, my opponent, who became a Supreme Court justice years later, he and I have talked, and we, we both agree uh, in our dotage that uh, the people at the time were no less well-informed than they are today. In fact, they're probably better informed because of the way the, 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 the funds were husbanded and used and uh, rather than all the attack ads that you can do with, with oodles of money. Um, I should make uh, one conf confession. I was, uh, well, now you make it after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I, 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 okay. I, 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 we'll I do it for the paperback. It okay. took, it took, it took Excuse very, me just a second. very strong legislative leadership to pass that campaign finance limitation. Uh, I was the House Majority Leader at the time, and I uh, helped pass that law. The fact that I ran again, uh, ran for the Congress just one year later is merely a coincidence. That's <laughs> merely a coincidence. <laughs> Those things happen so but often. But I, I agree with you. You know, uh, what, the biggest problem in the country, and I think all of my colleagues here and most people here, and I know you, John, feel, the problem is that we've, we've to a great extent, turned our lawmakers into telemarketers, and Ricky Nolan. Has, has said that on uh, 60 Minutes in a wonderful interview he gave. And it's, it's just got to stop somehow. I don't know how, but it, it really is the number one problem. Someone did ask about uh, the, the, one of the earlier questions about the fact there was one member of the class left. I should point out there's a, there's a big asterisk next to Rick Nolan's name. Uh, he was elected from Minnesota, but he left Congress in 1980. He came back 32 years later, the longest uh, interim of any, uh, of any member of Congress in history, and he's just announced that he's not going to run again. So at the end of this uh, Congress, at the end of this year, will be the first time uh, since 1975 that there are no members of the House uh, class of 74 in the House of Representatives. Mr. John, Weiss. Congratulations on Thank the book. And great talk. I was wondering if you could speak as a historian. You, you mentioned um, some of the leadership on both the Democratic and Republican side had less than flattering comments about the class of 74, and you also said that the class of 74, things are attributed to them that didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily their goals. In interviewing the members of the class of 74 without necessarily putting any of our former members of Congress on the spot, did you find their assessment uh, or recollections of their goals or their activities differed in significant ways from the historical record? No, I think that they, I think that, uh, again, I would constantly ask them, why did you run? What was your motivation for running? And I was, I was stunned on, on, and I have a whole chapter in the book about the Republicans, incidentally. I'll, let me mention that for a second. But uh, how consistently Vietnam was mentioned. You know, a lot of people think these guys ran because of Watergate. But, you know, they made their decisions to run when the Watergate investigations were still at a reasonably early stage. Um, you know, mostly in early, late 73, even early 74. And we don't get into the impeachment hearings until the summer of 74. Uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the resignation is in August of 74. The pardon is in September of 74. They had made their decisions already. That, that, wasn't, the, that wasn't the reason they were running. They were running overwhelmingly. They were running uh, because of, uh, of, 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 of Vietnam. There were some people, there was Gary Myers and there was Berkeley Bedell, people who felt, you know, these other people have just been there too long. They're, we need some new faces. Um, but uh, overwhelming, I found the, 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 the issue was, was, uh, was, was Vietnam. I, I would say about the Republicans also, it, I, I, the reason that I talk mostly about the Democrats is not because I worked for Democrats or I, I am a Democrat. It's just that these reforms were effectuated through the Democratic caucus. They were not done on the House floor. If they had been, if there had been an effort to pass these changes through the House floor, then that conservative coalition would probably have blocked them. But within the Democratic caucus, they were able to pass legislation because of the infusion of the class of 1974. And in fact, the caucus became empowered somewhat briefly, where the, the more liberal members decided that they were going to try to pass caucus votes to bind the entire caucus to vote in certain ways uh, on legislation once it got to the floor. And that didn't hold up very well or for very, very long. There, there was a lot of pushback that... That, that was taking a step uh, that was taking a step too far. But I, I do have this whole chapter on the Republicans, and even on the Republican side, uh, there were a lot of people who felt that they were coming here to as reformers. 
Um, and uh, several of them, as, as the chapter describes, expressed a lot of regret that they didn't have an opportunity to play a more significant role because all of, the, all of this work was being done within the Democratic Caucus. And of course, regardless of how, how positive and inclined towards reform they were, they, they had no role to play in the, in the Democratic Caucus as, as Republican members. And many of them ended up not staying around very long, in part because they felt, on the one hand, they couldn't participate as fully with that Democratic Caucus as they might have wanted to on certain issues. But they also felt this growing pressure from this hard right group that was largely outside Congress, but became, quickly becoming the, the, most, uh, the most aggressive part of the, uh, of the uh, Republican Party. And it's interesting to note about that, that group that they identified their leadership as the problem, just as many people in the Democratic caucus identified their, uh, the Democratic leadership as the problem. They viewed the Republican leadership as too cautious, uh, as too willing to accommodate, and particularly too locked into the notion that they were a permanent minority and could not, could not challenge for, for the majority. In fact, in, in, uh, I think in August or September of 1994, so we're only talking about a few months from the time that their election is held uh, that results in the first Republican majority in 40 years in the House of Representatives, a book is published by two conservative political scientists from California that says the permanent Republican majority. And, and only at the last minute they added a question mark. Uh, the publisher said, well, you know, I don't, think it, I don't know if it sold very well, but it, it was quickly out of print. Yeah. Like any uh, Hi, great, Bernie. <laughs> like any great uh, book or movie, do you have a sequel in mind about the the staffers who came in with the class of '74, <laughs> and what 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 happened with them and what they did with uh, with that experience? I think the staffers do. I, I don't. I'm not, I'm not planning on uh, I'm not planning on uh, on on doing that. I you know it was. Uh, I, I'm not sure that the staff group was any any different than others. There are people who stuck around for a long time. There are people who ran for office. There are people who went off into uh, into uh, activist causes or into law firms, which are not the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else have a question? Oh, Karen? Yeah. So the, the, the question is, can this institution be saved? I'm, I really appreciate your asking that question, Karen. And, and here's the answer. And let me just start with the preface. I know that this is going to sound a little bit self-serving. And I don't mean it that way. I mean it, I, I am speaking purely as a historian in this, in this case. All those problems I mentioned in terms of the dysfunctionality of the current Congress, I think are accurate. I mean, I think they're, they're factual. I don't think they're driven by my ideology. Um, but I would, I would remind people that you only have to go back nine years or 10 years and you have what even the most serious critics of contemporary Congress call the most successful Congress of the last 75 years. And I would, I would make the point it's not just the first two years of the Obama administration where obviously the stars aligned similar to the way they did in 64 or the way they did in, 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 um, in 74. Uh, in terms of large congressional majorities. But even if you look at the last year of the, of the Bush administration, you had people who were working on a collaborative base. They didn't necessarily like each other. They didn't necessarily want to do a lot of policy together. But faced with an enormous uh, national crisis on the verge of an election, the Congress was able to work on a bipartisan basis to address uh, the, f the, the fiscal crisis. The Congress was able to address health care. They were able to address the, the aftermath of the financial services institutions. They were able to pass stimulus bills. They were able to pass the most progressive energy legislation in, in 25 years. That's an institution that was very functional. And there's nothing institutional about the Congress that's changed. What's changed is the people who are running the institution. And so when you say, is there hope? Yes, there is hope. And I, I'm not saying it's only hope from Democrats. Uh, most of, of, a lot of what was done was done with Republican support historically uh, in terms of good, positive legislation. But it very much affects the question of who, who you're sending to Washington. And I think one of the major differences, for example, between the class of 74 and subsequent wave elections, 1994, 2010, is 
these guys, as I mentioned in my talk, they did not come to Washington to destroy Washington. They came to make government work because they saw government as a fundamental institution to accomplish the goals that they sought as policies. And I think that's a major difference with, with people who you've seen arrive in those subsequent wave classes where they viewed Washington as the problem and they don't have a huge investment in maintaining either the integrity, the reputation, or the operability of the, of the Congress. So I think it really comes down to the question of who is, who is in charge and, and what their objectives are. If the people who are in charge don't care if Congress gets a bad name because they don't, they don't feel invested in the institution to begin with, then uh, you're going to have a very hard time having a productive uh, uh, or responsive Congress. Hi, oh, Kathy. Yeah. Hi, John. Hi, Kathy. Congratulations, and thank, thank you. you so much for writing this book. I think Thanks. it's really going to be an important book in, in this time. Thank you. I have a fairly incoherent question about, um, but kind of looking at your long career and you know the people that you've worked with, um, looking at it from the point of view of an activist today, it's a, sort of it's a question about the relationship between movements and sort of the inside politics. Mm -hmm. So, what would you say to young or even not so young activists who are kind of up and resisting now? Um, What's the relationship to Congress? How do, how do you how do you think about that process? Well, you know, I always oh, oh, so the the relationship between young activists. What advice might I give them and and their relationship to Congress or to electoral politics, maybe more more generally? And I always I always tell my students that there's a difference between activism and politics. Activists are uh, advocacy is is telling you what I think, and politics is getting you to agree with me. And those are two different skills. But I think that they're both important skills. I mean, I don't think that every activist should work in a political campaign. I don't think that the only route for social change or political change is through elective politics. Where I think there there's, there's becomes a problem is that people don't understand that, that when you do make that transformation from activism into, into a, a political process, which is inherently a collaborative process, process, you're going to encounter people who have just as much uh, commitment to their points of view as you do. And so simply saying it louder, as I used to say to George Miller sometimes, doesn't necessarily <laughs> convince anybody. You know, you, 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 so partly it is um, bringing people uh, from activist uh, organizations or activist movements into the process, not to be discouraged because they're not going to get everything they want. Um, but, uh, but also on the part of, of politicians welcoming them, realizing that part of the, your responsibility as an elected official is to, is to receive that message, and then your job is to translate it into policy. Sometimes that creates friction. It did with every major piece of legislation I worked on. That's the nature of the business. If you can't do that, you're in the wrong business. Um, but uh, I really do believe that, uh, you know, the, 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 the single most encouraging things that I that I see going on uh, is is young people's activism because I'm not sure if I were young under these circumstances that I would draw the conclusion that it was a useful you know uh, commitment of my time to go getting into politics when I see politics rejecting so much of what I what you want to do and and I think of this very much in terms of my own students you know if you're 18 19 years old most of your mature years, you've seen nothing but dysfunction. You've seen nothing but, but rancor and, and partisanship. And, and, and that's, that's a very disturbing uh, situation. And yet, when I did a poll with my students at the University of California uh, here in DC uh, after the last election, and I asked them how many were happy with the outcome of the election, uh, very few were. And I asked, uh, uh, and does this outcome make you more or less likely to want to get involved in politics. And every single one of them said more. So I find that incredibly, I look at the response of the students in Florida, or I look at um, the people with Invincible. I mean, that, that's just tremendously encouraging. And I think uh, one of the important messages of, of this book and uh, those of us who spent our lives in politics is that that, that political system will respond with the right stimulus, with the right people g moving into office. And the, the key is to make sure that, that people who do care about our issues make that personal commitment to get into politics, or at least to vote and, and make, their, make their, their, uh, uh, their views known. Thanks.